Good morning. My name is Chris Deeran. I'm Director of Reform Scotland and welcome to our latest Holyrood election event where today we'll be discussing the role immigration can play in Scotland's future. Uh, this event is based around our latest report in partnership with the Scottish Policy Foundation and I think it's one of the best pieces of work we've produced. I'm sure Alison would agree with me on that. It, it's called Entry Points, Making a Success of Immigration to Scotland. Hopefully you've had a chance to read it. Uh, and if not, you'll find it on the Reform Scotland website, and I highly recommend you do because it, it really is superb. Uh, the facts are stark. Without a certain level of immigration, Scotland's working age population is projected to decline over the next 25 years. The number of Scots in the 65 to 74 age group is expected to increase by 17%, and the number aged 75 and above to rise by 79%. Unfortunately, and if sometimes understandably given the chilly climate, Scotland also has the lowest fertility rate in the UK. This all means a smaller proportion of working people would have to fund the expanding costs and care of a, a rapidly ageing population. The report's author, Heather McCauley, who joins us from Wellington in New Zealand today, uh, I see Heather as a sort of expert policy minstrel, travelling from court to court, sorting stuff out with her vast toolkit before moving on to the next challenge. She, she is a former senior civil servant whose roles have included being policy advisor to two New Zealand prime ministers from 2001 to 2012, during which time she advised on a root and branch review of immigration policy and delivery as well as a wide range of related economic and social policy issues. Heather also worked as a senior civil servant in the Scottish Government from 2012 to 2016, uh, and she also did her, uh, her time at Westminster. Uh, there seems to be broad support among politicians in Scotland for greater immigration to, to this country, but this is often in the abstract. There's sometimes perhaps a naivety about what it would entail in practice. There are opportunities, but there are also very real challenges the preparatory work that's required, the systems that need to be put in place, the possible social and cultural consequences, uh, over expectations of the impact that immigrants might have. So we asked Heather to take a hard-headed, evidence-driven look at the role immigrants might play in Scotland's future. In doing so, she has explored the experiences, both good and bad, uh, of migrant receiving countries like New Zealand, Canada, Australia, the US. She's looked at what has worked and what hasn't and drawn lessons for a post-Brexit Scotland. I should say that at Reform Scotland, we are in favour of immigration for economic, demographic and cultural reasons. But we do feel it's important Scotland approaches the issue with its eyes open. Uh, so first this morning, Heather is going to set out some of her key findings from the report. Uh, I'll then ask her some questions and then we shall open it up to the floor. So uh, do send me any questions that you might have using the message button on your, your Zoom screen uh, and we'll get through as many of them as, as we can. It's always better when it's a conversation with you rather than just us talking at you. Um, and uh, I just ask you again to mute yourself if you're not Heather or me, please, so that there's no background noise. Uh, and then over to you, Heather. I, I might just ask at the start, what time is it in Wellington? It's just after 10 o'clock at night. All oh, right, still relatively yeah. And early. I'm heading into autumn, so very dark at this time of night now. <laughs> so you're going to give us a, a bit of a pre-see of the, the report, um, and then I'll ask you some questions about that afterwards. So I'll just leave it with you for now. OK, sure. So this was a paper looking at what we can draw from the experience of some of those traditional migrant receiving countries, as Chris said, about what immigration can do and can't do for a country. and it, mainly focuses on Australia, New Zealand and Canada, but I've also drawn on some evidence from the US, the UK and Europe. And, and we focused on permanent migration or settlement because that seemed to have been the main area of public policy interest in Scotland at the time. And I guess because we're all influenced by our own experience, I thought I'd start by just saying a few words about mine, both personal and professional and how that kind of has influenced how I approach the subject. Um, so personally, my family moved uh, to New Zealand from Northern Ireland um, when I was a child in the 1970s. Please don't do the sums. Um, and the intention was that we would just move, be moving for a year or two until the troubles blew over. Um, and as I'm sure you all know, the troubles didn't blow over um, in a year or two or even a decade. But it was only really once we'd been in New Zealand for maybe even 15 years that we kind of realised, stop talking about go, we'll be going back next year or the following year and, and realised we were staying permanently. And then on the other side, although I've spent most of my adult career working in New Zealand, I've also lived and worked in London for three years and Edinburgh for seven years. And 
One thing I take from all of that is that there definitely isn't a strict delineation between temporary and permanent migration. So temporary migrants like ourselves can become permanent settlers and some countries, New Zealand's one of them, set their policy up to encourage that. And on the other side, quite a sizable minority of permanent migrants end up leaving. So even in the US, which is kind of, you know, the, the, the big migrant destination with the highest wages and so on, um, you still get about a quarter to a third of permanent migrants leaving at some later date. And the figure is similar in New Zealand. Um, Another thing I take from my own experience is that people's intentions at the point of arriving in a country may not be a very good indicator of what actually happens for them. And the category that they arrive in may also not be a very good indicator of where they end up. So professionally, I worked as a senior civil servant, as, as Chris said, in the Prime Minister's department here for 11 years. And it was at a time I was advising on immigration and the, the government was doing a very fundamental review. We worked through almost every aspect of immigration policy oh, and, and administration. And um, the aim was to make it more beneficial for the country and, and for migrants themselves. And a couple of things that I took from that work was, you know, having reviewed all the evidence and so on, that, that immigration clearly could be beneficial for a country, but the way you design and manage your program really does matter for the outcomes that you get. Um, and also that while policy is important, actually your delivery approach and the other initiatives that you put around it matter and probably at least as much. So most of the evidence and I, most of what I'll talk about today does focus on the policy settings and actually most of the political debate seems to focus on that as well. But there's an awful lot you can do to increase the effectiveness of your immigration um, outside of policy. So in the paper, for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at it, I, I look a bit at the context in Scotland. I look at what we know from other countries about the impacts of immigration and including for regionally differentiated programmes and then think about the implications of that or, or raise some considerations for policy and programme design. And I'm not going to go through every point here. What I've just thought I'd do is pick out a couple of points under each of those headings to highlight. Um, one thing I really want to stress is that there's no right or wrong level of immigration for a country. So you can look at the evidence around the impacts, but I firmly believe that the choice reflects a country's history, its context, its values, and its vision of what kind of country it wants to be. And that's very much for the people of Scotland to decide. Um, and also the evidence that I'm looking at in the paper predates the pandemic. Now clearly the context for immigration has changed profoundly um, in the short term, but the pandemic's actually also created a, a unique space for countries to consider what kinds of immigration programs they want to have as, as travel starts to open up again. And so paradoxically, it's actually an ideal moment for Scotland to be having this, this discussion. Um, having had a quick skim down the, the attendance list, I think most of you are Scottish based and, and you'll be familiar with the Scottish context, so I'm not gonna go through that. Um, I guess just a couple of observations, including kind of a, as an outsider, is that it's notable how much the discussion tends to be grounded in a population context. And that was the context, Chris, I think that you very much, you know, introduced this uh, by. So you've, you've got a, a population that's been growing since the early 2000s, that's projected to continue to grow in absolute size for the next 25 years, but that growth is entirely dependent on immigration. It's worth saying that that's not unusual in Europe. Um, so, you know, that, that's not necessarily sort of some kind of outlying situation. The population's aging, as Chris said, and, and there's a particular concern I'd add about the remote and rural areas. Uh, a number are experiencing depopulation and particular economic challenges. On the policy kind of context side, you know, I think you all know probably that immigration policy is reserved to the UK government. The UK government's just introduced a new points-based immigration system, which is broadly similar to the systems in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. So that's one reason why it's quite helpful to look at these three countries in particular. Um, that system targets skilled migrants primarily, and it will largely halt the immigration of low skilled or low waged workers unless they have a job offer in a shortage occupation. The Scottish Government set out proposals last year for a separate Scottish visa, but that was rejected by the UK. And the Scottish Government's also called for pilot schemes to explore ways to attract and retain migrants in remote and rural areas. And one other contextual point that's sometimes missed, and there's a couple of graphs, I think they're on page 14 and 15 of the paper, if anybody has it handy, 
um, is that the UK doesn't actually have large flows of permanent migrants relative to its population. So its, uh, its rate of permanent migration um, is below the OECD average, and it's very significantly lower than Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. The UK does have slightly above the OECD average for the proportion of foreign-born people in its population, the graphs on page 15, but again, that proportion is significantly lower than Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. So these three countries are really useful to look at, I think, if Scotland is thinking that it might want more or a different mix of immigration in the future, because they really um, illuminate what the pros and cons and some of the implications of having a much larger immig immigration programme might be. So what do we know from these countries about what the impacts are? Um, the two biggest things countries are generally looking for are economic benefits and population. Um, on the economic side, there's a lot of different dimensions. So I'll just highlight a couple. Um, if we're looking at a kind of composite measure for total impact, then obviously that's GDP. Immigration will usually boost your GDP in simple terms. If you have more people, you have more workers, more consumers, you have a bigger economy. Um, but what matters if you want to increase living standards is productivity and your per capita GDP, your per person GDP. For people already in the country, the fact that there's more people and, and there's a bigger economy doesn't actually help them unless the per capita GDP is increasing. Now, what the studies generally find is that immigration does have a positive impact on GDP per person, but it's a relatively modest one. So in simple terms, migrants usually have higher labor market participation, higher hours worked, and higher skills, but that's partially offset by capital dilution and a decline in the terms of trade. So you have pros and cons, you usually come out with a small net benefit. The other thing to realize is that it can take time to materialize. So the OECD did an assessment of New Zealand in 2017 and found that immigration at that time was actually a drag on GDP per capita initially. Now, it recognised that the skills and, and, and attributes that migrants were bringing were going to be an asset in the longer term for the country. But in the short term, the sheer number of people that were coming in, if you think you know, they're the denominator um, in your per capita growth, um, was actually pulling, pulling, immigration, pulling GDP per capita back. Um, employment and wages is usually a really big concern. You know, people want immigration, but they don't want to displace locals um, in the labour market or see reduced or depressed wages. Studies have typically not found that that's an effect overall, um, but they do find small negative effects in the short term. And it's usually for the people who compete directly with migrants in the labour market. So where migrants are substitutes for locals rather than complements, to use the lingo. Um, to give another example, the countries usually find, you know, countries are usually interested to boost the public purse, the, the coffers, um, and they usually find that migrants do pay more in taxes than they incur in benefits and public services overall. But again, those net benefits are small. Um, and I think, you know, those are point in time assessments. Over the long term, migrants' fiscal impact looks a lot more like that of locals, because they also age, they access healthcare and pensions, they have children. So there isn't as big a difference as people sometimes think when they think, oh, we're getting somebody, somebody else has paid for their education, we're kind of getting all of that for free. And I think quite a stark finding is that internationally, most migrants actually bring a net fiscal cost for governments, except for those in their 20s and 30s. So that's really important to understand, because if you have a population goal, you're likely to be targeting families, not just people in their 20s and 30s who are single, for example. And that's a completely valid thing to do if you have population objectives, community well-being objectives, and it's actually important for the migrants themselves to be able to bring their families. But you, it's important to understand that how that adds up in terms of the fiscal cost will be quite different if, depending on that mix. Um, I think also I just want to add finally that there's some economic impacts that people claim immigration will have, and it can have them, but you can't assume it will in your particular context. So the classic example is innovation. And um, you kind of assume migrants are going to be innovative because they'll have higher skills and more diverse and they'll bring new ideas and all of that. In New Zealand, no one's been able to find any evidence of a link between innovation and immigration. 
It's not to say immigrants don't bring other valuable things, but they don't appear to boost the kind of degree of immigration in the economy. Um, in countries where there is evidence, it's often very context specific. So immigration is associated with innovation in the US, but that's mainly due to graduate students, not uh, skilled migrants. And it depends a lot on who you're bringing in. So the Australian Productivity Commission did some um, modeling and they estimated that a 50% increase in, in skilled migration into Australia would not have a substantial impact on productivity. And that's because the numbers would still be, although that's a massive increase in an immigration program, which is already very large, those numbers are really small compared to your total population. And it was also because the migrants weren't very different to the Australian born population. So they weren't bringing something different. And it also depends on whether the conditions are in place in the receiving country to take advantage of migrants' diversity and new ideas. So simply helicoptering in a few innovative migrants doesn't transform an economy or even one firm if the other conditions aren't in place. And if the firm or the sector um, isn't receptive to those new ideas, able to engage with them and able to respond to them. And finally, on the economic side, the other thing I kind of really want to stress is that the effects are dynamic. So they depend on the level and mix of immigration, which is what people tend to focus on. But they also depend on how quickly the economy can adjust to those people coming in, and particularly to the change in, in the supply of labour and the supply of skills. So I mentioned the other big thing is population, demographic. Um, the picture is really clear. Immigration can maintain or grow a population in absolute, in terms of its absolute size, but it can't significantly change its age structure. And that's especially true where a population is aging. Um, this was really well established. Um, the UN did modeling in the early 2000s across a whole range of countries, um, which found that for most countries to offset population aging, they'd need to have vastly more immigration than the levels that occurred in the past. They were simply at unrealistic levels. And what migrants can do though, is give a short-term boost to your working age population. And I think most importantly, they can help you fill some of the skill and labor shortages that you might have as a result of an aging population. And I think especially where it would take a bit of time to train people and you need to reset your education, your education system to be, to be generating those skills domestically. Now, the paper also talks about what we know about other kinds of impacts on the natural environment, on happiness or subjective well-being. And I'd want to stress that those are at least as important as the economic and the demographic impacts, but they're also generally less well researched. Um, so I can come back and touch on those later if you want to. But the overall conclusion kind of weighing it all up um, is that immigration can definitely be beneficial overall for a country. But the benefits are, sm are smaller than people often claim, particularly when they're weighed up against the costs. And I think that there's a big risk that if those benefits are overstated, that it can divert attention from some of the harder policy choices that, that are otherwise required. Choices that need to be taken to ensure your education system is producing the skills that employers need, that firms are providing good wages and conditions and not kind of on drive to the bottom that you're addressing the root causes of depopulation and poor economic performance, and the, con the economy is becoming more productive. And also um, the, the, the steps that need to be taken to adjust to a different age distribution, not just think that you can somehow change it. So the, the paper has a chapter on regionally differentiated policies and looking at the experience of that also. And, and you know, most regionally differentiated policies basically have a lower bar for entry in exchange for a requirement to live and, and work in, I guess, a non-traditional destination, perhaps outside the major cities or in a state or province that is not, not traditionally attracted migrants. Um, countries do it in different ways. Sometimes uh, in New Zealand and Australia, you can get extra points for a job offer within the, the wider point system. Uh, some provinces and states in Australia and Canada have separate complementary systems to the main federal or, or national government system. Um, and there's some particular pilots that I can talk about later, uh, uh, looking at ways to attract people to remote and rural areas in Canada particularly. 
Um, what these countries have found, because I was sort of less interested in the, the nitty gritty of that, because it's so context specific and, and anything that was done in Scotland would really have to be designed for the Scottish context. Um, but I was interested to see what kind of impact these countries, these sort of schemes had had. And what the countries have found is these schemes can definitely help attract migrants to, period, uh, to the regions for a period of time. So in Australia, the proportion of their economic migrants who settled outside the three largest states increased from 10% to 34% over a 20 year period. That's a really big increase. In New Zealand, you can get extra points as a skilled migrant if your job offers outside the main metropolitan area of Auckland. And the last uh, figures that I saw, 53% of skilled migrants were claiming those points. So you can definitely help encourage people to go to other places than the, than the main you, you know, typical destinations. But the evidence also shows that it's pretty difficult to retain them beyond the duration of their visa if the right economic conditions aren't in place. Um, and retention rates are always poorest in the most remote areas, which are the areas that actually the governments are typically most concerned to try to assist. And that's not surprising. Um, migrants' movements within a country tend to mirror the movements of the local population. So if locals move to cities or move south or move north, in the case of New Zealand, um, because that's where the jobs and the opportunities are, then so will migrants. I don't think there's any reason to think they would behave differently. And actually, they, they probably do that um, to a greater degree because they have fewer ties and they have more recent experience of moving. Um, so in the paper, I note that Australia and New Zealand and Canada are both taking steps to try to improve retention. And I can talk about those a bit more, but I think you know, the jury is out on whether those adjustments will work and whether they'll be sufficient to, to counter the, the broader economic forces that are driving or drawing people elsewhere. Um, so I'm just going to sort of figure, finish these sort of opening remarks by talking about a few of the kind of considerations for policy design that fall out of all of this. Um, I'll just pick out maybe three, maybe four, if I can squeeze forth in um, to highlight. The first is, um, you know, I think the biggest thing is to be really clear and concrete about your goal. On population, for example, are you trying to grow the size of the total population? Are you only trying to grow the working age population? Are you trying to fill labour and skill shortages? Are you trying to have a concentrated population or are you trying to disperse your population? Those things are often conflated in some of the reports that I've seen or treated as if you can have all of those at once. Um, and I think there's a big question to be asked, especially about an aim of growing the population size, because we know that bigger isn't necessarily better um, across a whole range of outcomes. And David Skilling's done work for Reform Scotland previously around, around the performance of small countries versus large. So I'd say that the onus is on those who are arguing for a, a bigger population to, to show why there'd be benefits. What's the causal pathway? And typically they're thinking it's, it's because of scale and agglomeration benefits. And if that's the case, then what level and mix of immigration would be required to achieve that? You know, are we talking about adding a million people to the Scottish population? Are we talking about adding 5 million, 10 million? And whatever it is, you know, um, how much immigration would you need to do that? Because, of course, your immigration needs to also offset your people leaving as well. If you model that, you can then have an informed discussion with people in the country, the people of Scotland, about whether it's feasible and what it would actually mean, what it would take to achieve that. Um, and whether that's the kind of you know, transformation or the route to transformation that they want. So the first thing for me is be really clear about your goal and specific and, and, and understand what scale and type of immigration you need to achieve it. The second thing I'd really highlight is that there's trade-offs. And I think you need to be clear about the balance that you want to strike, particularly between any productivity goals and access to migrant labour for employers. So the dilemma is that low skilled workers, access to low skilled workers can undermine productivity improvement. And I've cited US evidence in the paper that shows that higher inflows of low skilled workers is associated with more labor intensive practices, slower adoption of technology. And so actually the, the policy discussion often focuses on will immigration have reduced employment for locals or will it depress wages? And, and those are valid concerns, but we typically find that they, it doesn't. 
But this work suggests that actually the more significant impact may be on productivity, that that's where the trade-off mainly lies. And I think that's really critical given Scotland's relatively poor rates of productivity growth, which have just been highlighted again in the Hunter Foundation report that was out last week. Um, thirdly, I'd say understand the distribution of impacts of immigration. So everything I've talked about so far has been averages. Um, but the, the impacts and both positive and negative are unevenly distributed across different groups of people, across places and over time. And they vary, particularly according to people's employment status, their wealth, including whether they own a house or not, and their location. Um, and I think I'd also want to say that the impact on social norms and culture is also experienced difficult, differently by different people, although that's really difficult to quantify. Um, there's research that suggests that public attitudes are not necessarily related to economic impact. And I think, you know, in the whole Brexit debate, we, we probably saw that as well. So some, and some people can benefit economically, but still be concerned about some of the other effects, the perception of too rapid change or, or cultural dilution. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of stuff about the different time horizons that people, that, that impacts are felt mattering. Um, you know, do it, migrants tend to impact on your supply side or your demand side initially? And that, that you know, there's been a lag uh, in New Zealand around that that has had quite, you know, effects that have been quite dramatic at times. And it matters because some of the short term dynamics you might see, like pressure on infrastructure or pressure on public services, if you have a boost in your population, those can obscure some of the longer term effects, like the productivity gains. Those take time to feed through or the innovation benefits or, or just the benefits of a more diverse and vibrant com community as people become part of a community. And I've argued in the paper then that it's really important to understand kind of your, your level of absorptive capacity, um, which I'm using in a kind of loose way. But I think people get very hung up on this whole idea of, you know, is there a limit? Is there a cap? Is there a, a quota for immigration? You know, even if you don't set any kind of limit, um, you still have a limit in terms of your, the capacity of your economy and society to successfully bring people in and, and, and um, help them to have positive outcomes. That's about the responsiveness of um, your labour market, your housing, your transport infrastructure, your education and health services. Um, so I think it's really important to understand that because the, the impacts of immigration, while we can say it's beneficial at the national level in all these different ways, the, the, uh, the impacts of immigration are felt by people very locally. And so I think it's really important to understand the impacts and also people's views and attitudes at a local level, because people who come in are going to live in a local area. And then finally, the one that I'm going to just squeeze in before I pass back to Chris. I think, um, you know, obviously, and I really want to stress, immigration has much wider benefits and costs than just the economic or, or the fiscal. But I think that a government who has to balance a budget needs to directly understand how uh, immigration will impact on the government's accounts. And that depends on the mix of immigration, that the age mix, the family mix, the skills mix, the employment mix. It depends on what support you're going to provide and fund for migrants and, and including what eligibility you will provide or not for publicly funded benefits and entitlements. All of that will influence the outcomes you get and it will influence the costs of different groups. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to whether you have, you focus purely on skills or you have more open policy, whether you focus primarily on workers uh, and whether you have more limited or wider uh, family entitlements, for example. But I do think you need to understand what those different things will cost um, in order to ensure that they're successful for the people who come in. And what you're, so in a sense, what you're prepared to invest in order to have those groups. And I guess in the context of Scotland, you, it's important to understand where those costs will fall between the UK government and the Scottish government and between the Scottish government and local government. And not just in the initial period when migrants first arrive, but, but also in the longer term. So I'm gonna pause there and pass back to Chris and see where you'd like to take it from here. Thank you very much, Heather. That was a hugely insightful and, and comprehensive uh, uh, run through your, your findings. I think, as we've both said, there is seems to be broad political appetite for more immigration in Scotland. And perhaps a sense has been allowed to grow that it could be the answer to some, if not many, of our demographic and economic challenges. 
we have issues, as you say, with things like rural and seasonal demography, issues with the declining working age population potentially, and the demands an ageing population would put on the taxpayer. And you warn, rightly and importantly, that immigration isn't a silver bullet uh, when it comes to any of these things. And you spoke quite eloquently there about deciding in advance what it is we're seeking to achieve. How do we begin that process? Is it as simple as deciding basic principles? And how does it unfold from that to the point of then delivering policy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, be very clear about your objectives and model the scalar mix required. Um, the countries that I've looked at in this report have systems that are oriented towards economic objectives. Now, in the course of doing that, they also tend to grow their populations as a result of immigration, but they tend to structure their systems primarily in order to maximize their economic outcomes. I'm not talking about humanitarian immigration, that was a, a different set of objectives. So we're just sort of setting that aside for now. Um, but I think you also have to understand what it is you will get from the immigrant, from, from. So, so in the case of New Zealand, I think our, our program's been pretty successful. We have over many decades brought in around 40, well not brought in, approved around 45,000 permanent, new permanent migrants a year in a population that's generally been about four and a half million. So 1% of population a year. And during the last decade, sometimes that hit 2%. That's a very large immigration program. If you think every year, that's another one or 2% coming in. Um, but it's also been criticized because uh, some people would argue that the people that have been brought in have mainly been people who will fill skill and labour gaps, and therefore we haven't seen New Zealand's productivity, uh, uh, immigration hasn't been associated with productivity improvement in New Zealand. So I think you have to really think about what it is you're trying to achieve, um, and as I say, what, what you're prepared to pay for that. Having done that, there's then a question about which bits of your policy or your, or your initiatives you want to have uh, keep stable, keep sustained, and which bits you want to tie to the economic cycle. So, you know, all three countries that I've looked at uh, don't have a target or a cap particularly, but they do set a kind of planning range and they generally, you know, move it slightly up or down over time, but not by that much. As I say, New Zealand, it's usually about 45,000. That's quite important reputationally, um, because, uh, you know, I don't think with permanent migration, it's particularly helpful uh, I, I guess you, we think certainly here, and I think in Australia too, we think about ourselves as being, you know, in a competition for talent internationally, and particularly with the aging demographic in Europe. And as uh, the US starts to look as though it's going to tip over from, from growing to, to much more of an aging profile as well. Um, so there's increasing competition from a lot of countries for some of the skills and so on that, that we want. So um, there's reputational benefits to having a stable program that immigration agents and the people who are the intermediaries, you know, know will be there a year in, year out. It's not that we're turning the tap on and off. That's actually also really important in terms of being able to plan and administer a system effectively. But on the other hand, think about which bits need, you know, you do want to tie to the, the economic cycle. So, for example, having a labour market test you know, that's a mechanism to sort of turn it up and turn it down a bit to put as unemployment within your local economy turns it up and turn it down. So, so to balance that with your objectives around employment of people already in the country. Think about the wait waiting between groups. So um, even within permanent migration, these three countries all have um, to allocate a proportion of the places. And that really, I think, reflects and makes transparent what they're trying to achieve. So, you know, in New Zealand, I think it's 51% for skills. Um, in Australia, 68%. In Canada, 58%. And then there's a portion for family and a portion for humanitarian or whatever. Um, and then think about what your balance is between permanent and temporary, because one of the things that I think, I mean, I've focused on permanent in this report, but in all of these countries, the number of temporary migrants massively outweighs the number of permanent migrants coming in to settle long term. That really matters because people's perception of immigration is driven largely, as I say, locally, it's, it's driven by what they see. And they don't go up and ask people, are, are, you, are you on a permanent visa or are you here as a student or are you here on a working holiday or you, so, you know, so actually what we've discovered in New Zealand is that we might hold that permanent migration level fairly stable, but the temporary migration has 
fluctuated a huge amount and that does affect people's perceptions but it also of course affects some aspects of that absorptive capacity um, understand the fiscal costs and benefits i've talked about that i think no right or wrong but what are you prepared to pay understand what those implications are and i think particularly over the short or long term um also think about who carries the risk of poor outcomes so i think in effect there's two things that determines that one's your entry criteria and the other is your eligibility for publicly funded services um and this is the fiscal cost i mean obviously poor outcomes have a range of other costs for people um but together those will determine whether you as a country are carrying that fiscal risk of, of poor outcomes or the migrants themselves are um, and I guess one final thing I'd throw in here is, um, oh, two maybe, is, is think about demand management. I was really struck when I lived in Scotland that often I kind of hit, hit a slight attitude of, oh, you know, surprise that people wanted to come to Scotland. I, th I think maybe the climate had something to do with it. I'm not sure. Um, whereas we absolutely loved living in Scotland. We thought it was a fantastic place for families. We thought that the, the, the culture, the access to their natural environment, the just heaps of stuff, you know, was really fantastic. And, and I think what I would say is that, especially if, if you were to have a scheme that had, you know, either reduced eligibility criteria or some other benefits for migrants, then migrants and the agents who advise them are very likely to gravitate towards it. So we found, the UK has found, it's a very common finding that migrants will gravitate towards the easiest, the cheapest and the fastest route. There's plenty of countries uh, that have introduced new types of visas. Very classically, it's often like an entrepreneur type visa where you don't have to have a job offer and you don't maybe have to have the same kind of formal you know, university qualifications or something. We're wanting the kind of the next Facebook person or whatever. Often introduce those um, and then find they're absolutely swamped with applications. And I think particularly if things are tightening and becoming more difficult at the wider UK level, that then will be a particular risk were things to be easier, faster, cheaper in Scotland. So in that case, you need to think about how you would manage demand, because it's also really bad reputationally. If you get swamped with applications, you don't have the capacity to process them. You don't have the capacity to welcome people and to ensure that they have successful outcomes. And, and I think all of that, actually, you know, it's easy to say you're being kind of kind to migrants or welcoming or whatever if you have lower criteria. But, but the other thing about that is, you know, if, if migrants meet criteria to move to a country, I think they will usually and pretty reasonably expect that they'll be able to get a job and expect that they'll be able to get a job at a similar level that, to the one that they had before. And if those things don't happen or don't happen within some period of time, they're likely to be quite disappointed. That's not good reputationally. So I again, I mean, just thinking back to New Zealand, we had a period in the 90s, for example, where we attracted a huge number, of, a, a large number of Eastern European, very highly qualified people, and you would have surgeons driving taxis. Um, and that wasn't because of anything the government was doing, that was because of occupational licensing um, in the health sector. And a couple of years ago, I had a friend here who had, ran a legal firm, he was partner in a legal firm here, hugely experienced, moved to Scotland, would have had to retrain for a couple of years before he could have practiced. So I think it's, you know, it's really important to think those things through and not to think that, you know, opening up access is necessarily, you know, being, being kind to people if the experience once they get there isn't going to meet those, those expectations that you've perhaps set. Mm. I suppose it's worth making the point that it's not like Scotland's been shut for the last no. decades, but there hasn't necessarily been a great scramble to get here. And just because we've decided we'd like people to come, that doesn't mean that they will. And you pointed yeah. out that there is growing international competition to, 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 to uh, immigrants because of the aging populations in the West. Um, yeah. And you pointed out the easiest, cheapest and fastest can be the, the way to get them. But that brings a whole bunch of complications with it. So what would be a sensible way to stimulate the environment that makes Scotland a des more desirable destination yeah, 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 yeah. For, for immigrants amid all of those challenges? Sure. Um, so in the paper I highlight one, which is a fairly standard one to be honest, and so I'll talk about something more interesting in a minute, um, 
But I was interested to see that the, the EU, the OECD had concluded that for EU countries, it's not the policy settings that, that pose the greatest barrier to skilled migrants. It's the difficulty in finding jobs if you're from overseas, finding a job, lining up a job before you come and, and you need that. And actually the difficulty for firms in recruiting internationally, especially for smaller firms, or perhaps firms that only need to do it occasionally or for one occupation within their structure. So they've argued that initiatives to address that um, may be more beneficial than policy tweaks. So that's one thing. I have a couple of other thoughts. Um, one is to kind of really shift, shift your mindset as a country from uh, receiving applicants, from kind of, you know, the, the criteria or whatever it is are set, you, you stick your stall out, you have a website or it used to be brochures or whatever. Um, maybe you provide some information you know, for people and maybe even links through to, to some other stuff they might need to know about. Um, but you're basically being quite passive. You know, you're, you're set out a stall and we hope they will come and you, re you receive the applications and so on. To taking a more proactive, we're out there actively recruiting um, and we're actively recruiting and targeting the people that we most want rather than simply sitting and receiving the people who most want to come because those two things will not necessarily be, be the same. Um, so I guess, you know, thinking about what are the skills needed, I think particularly um, by groups of small firms in a particular region or, or communities. So, you know, are there groups of small firms in a particular region that have a shortage of engineers? If so, where in the world are there engineers where you might reasonably expect there are, if you like, push factors. Maybe their wages and conditions are not as good. And um, maybe there's other reasons why people are tending to emigrate from that part of the world. You know, so I would move away from blanket approaches, um, kind of you know, cross the board approaches. Um, and that also means moving away from kind of bricks and mortar offices, you know, let's stick an office in a country, um, to much more kind of mobile, targeted, flexible kind of fleet of foot approaches that really goes out and targets what it is that you're looking for. The other thing I'd say is to think, and this is something New Zealand has done a lot of uh, um, particularly, is to think about upselling to people who are already in the country. So we... What, one of the things I was going to add before, and I'll come back to, is kind of the importance of having really good data. Um, we, uh, when we did the big review, put in place uh, quite comprehensive longitudinal studies that tracked migrants over five years. And that meant that you could see a huge range of outcomes, but you could then see which factors were evident at the point of application that were correlated with the outcomes that we were wanting, both social and economic, and which weren't. Um, and one of the things we found was that previous experience in the country was associated with better settlement outcomes. Kind of obvious, you know, if you've been in the country, you know what it's like. You're not going to arrive and be completely disappointed or, or shocked by what you find. Um, and, and, and so we thought about, well, OK, so who has previous experience in the country? It's not just students. And I know Scotland has in the past looked at kind of study to work visa options, but it's people on temporary work permits, it's working holiday makers, it might even be visitors. Um, but in all of that, you know, the best thing is to have a highly targeted approach. Yeah. You don't want to market to every visitor who comes to the country, for yeah. example. Yeah. OK, um, well, listen, listen can I, just to take that on a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, Brexit, you know, yeah. pretty big thing on the on the British CV, if you like, and that was at least in part driven by hostility to, to immigration. And we've seen over the years incidents of violence and abuse towards immigrants. People are people. Scotland's no different to anywhere else. Um, what should the Scottish government do to prepare the current population for higher immigration? And what steps could it take to mitigate problems down the line in terms of integration, housing, public services and, and that kind of thing? Have there been good examples of that in, in other countries about just rolling the pitch? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so what I would say is that in all three of the countries I've looked at, they, they have, as I said, much larger immigration programs. The sheer numbers are much bigger and the proportion of the population that's foreign born is much bigger. Um, and even in those countries, which I think are broadly successful, you get periods of public concern. Um, and I think in each of those countries, that there's a political party that represents those concerns as well, often in the lead up to elections. Um, and I, my observation will be it's often when infrastructure or, or public services are under pressure or where the numbers are perceived to be particularly large or particularly concentrated. 
Um, look, first, as I said, understand your distribution. So I, I have two comments on this. You know, I think the, the, the most important thing to do is to actually really understand your impacts. It's no use standing up saying immigration is beneficial, GDP, whatever, if actually uh, people are experiencing a class full of kids who have English as a second language and insufficient support for that class, um, a longer queue at the hospital or whatever it happens to be. So I think you have to actually have a sophisticated understanding and, and feedback loops about how those, those are developing and be upfront with the population about that. Don't just sell it as it's all good. Um, but, and this is the bit that I, and that's just a matter of democratic, you know, proper public policy and, and democratic accountability. Um, but I think it's also problematic because, as I say, attitudes don't necessarily follow economic benefits. So you need to understand the attitudes separately to, you know, if you like, those, those benefits. And the thing that I find makes it difficult for me to answer this question is that there is some evidence that attitudes are relatively fixed. So I cite a study in the paper that looks at nine panel surveys, including the UK, across Europe and, and the US, and they basically found that attitudes for most people didn't change much over time, even in reaction to the global economic crisis, the refugee crisis, and so on. This was pre-COVID. They do change a bit in response to those things, but they tend to revert to a longer term norm. Now, it's different for some groups. Younger people seem to be more receptive. So there's quite a lot in there that we could look at, but it also suggests that those attitudes may be relatively fixed. And so where I get to on this is engage with communities. I do not think immigration should be top down, set by a national level government or even, you know, local authorities. I think you have to engage at the grassroots with communities. You need a social contract with the actual population in the place where the people are going to live. Um, and you need to work in partnership with them. So that would be the big thing that I would say. And I'm not sure that any of the countries that I've worked looked at do that particularly well, but there is a pilot running in Canada at the moment that's working with 11 communities where they are getting the communities to set, um, to essentially set some of the criteria for the people that they want and to then nominate people that they want, but that's still to be evaluated. So no, we'll that's see how that goes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'd like to, um, we'll probably run on a bit past the hour if that's okay, Heather, just because we've got a sure. few questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like to, to get through. I've got plenty more, but I'll move on to the audience uh, now. So I'll maybe start with, um, I'm just going to pick some that seem particularly germane. Um, Keith McDonald, Keith, are you, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Keith. Hi, okay. Um, the Scottish visa scheme, um, which I, I thought there was something in that that maybe wasn't perfect, but if I remember correctly, it was published at the beginning of a week, thrown at the Prime Minister at Prime Minister's questions on the Wednesday. He rejected it, probably knowing nothing about it. And yeah. by the Friday, Nicola Sturgeon was saying it was a reason for Scotland to leave the UK. In other words, it got caught up in the trench warfare between mm. the parties and, and as far as I know has now completely disappeared. It's not, never heard any more about it. I mean, do you think that's something that could provide the basis for a viable scheme uh, for Scotland? Um, it hasn't disappeared. So the population report that was out last month mentions it quite strongly again. Um, but yes, it was rejected very quickly. Um, look, what I think both... So both Australia and Canada run these kinds of schemes where you have a national level and then a, a state, if you like, in, in their context, can nominate some migrants according to different criteria. So it's perfectly feasible to run a scheme like that and then require people, it's usually tied to employment in a particular place, require people to live and work in a place for a, for a number of years. Um, I would say the thing that I think Two things about that. I think the arguments for that are strongest in your non-metropolitan areas. So right now, the four biggest cities in Scotland get 95% of the skilled migrants. Um, and you have growing populations um, in the central belt and so on. So the, the issue is that if you have a visa like that and you have some lower criteria, what you're doing, if you like, is diluting the quality and I, I, I hate to use that kind of terminology because it's pejorative but you're you're reducing the level of skill that you're bringing in amongst the migrant group um, and I would argue that in the main central belt or the, or the four main cities you probably don't need to do that 
So you could maintain that higher level of skill and, and attract people. Um, whereas I think there is a tr that is a trade-off that can be worth making for more remote, more rural communities where their, their sustainability and the well-being of their community is very dependent on having some of those skills and, and, and so on coming in. Um, the second thing I'd say about the, uh, but, but what you can, oh, the second thing I'd say about the Scottish visa uh, is that um, at the moment uh, it's silent on whether it would require a job offer, but it has said that it wouldn't have employer sponsorship, uh, the, the Scottish government would be the sponsor. And what I've said in the paper is essentially that's risky. Now, now this is something probably just worth pausing on because it's got, it's more generally relevant. There's a, there's a, I think a really, um, um, legitimate debate about whether for longer term settlement you want to require people to have jobs before they arrive or you want to look at a broader range of, of human capital characteristics and other attributes. Um, I think that's a very legitimate debate and I think the issue is that if you are able to um, identify the characteristics at that point of application that will be associated with that kind of contribution that you're wanting to see later, then that might work very well. But most countries find that really difficult to do. And as I've said, if there isn't a job offer requirement, people will gravitate towards that. So you will have a lot of people applying and you'll need some basis on which to choose between them. The, the other issue with not requiring a job offer at the point of arrival is that uh, people then need to sustain themselves. They need to make a living. So even if they are making a contribution to, to a local community in other ways, non-economic ways, they still have to live. So you have to think quite carefully, I think, about whether you want to, you know, you want to relax that requirement. But that's a, that's a detail of the Scottish visa. OK, thanks for that, Heather. Um, I, I'm interested in the point Anne Packard's made in the, the conversation about um, remote or rural entry and restrictions or constraints on moves after a, a number of years. And indeed, I was going to ask about that, not just in terms of remote and rural, but within a Scottish context, of course, mm. if you have Scottish uh, uh, focused immigration and you have a different climate in England where they're perhaps not looking for immigrants, how do you re retain uh, those people? Where those and, and do you want to add to that? Are you with us, Anne? No, don't think so. Well, so so maybe just talk about that, about how you ensure that people who arrive to fulfil a need in a certain geographic area stay and don't head off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, there you are. Hi. So sorry, somebody rang my doorbell and I had to collect a parcel. <laughs> <laughs> and did you want to say anything? Well, my question was, uh, is this one about rural co constraints? Uh, uh, one thing if people are to have in, in a just world, the capacity to move for jobs like other people, mm. what happens if you gain points to move to a remote rural area? in those countries that have point schemes, are you then able to move at any point? So that varies. Um, so in Australia, for example, they have designated areas and you are able under some of the visas to move to another designated area, but not to a city. Um, oh, actually what I meant to say, and it relates to the previous question as, as well as, as this one, is that with these provincial schemes, as I said, there's, there's the least retention in the most remote or the, or the most economically struggling areas. Um, and so even where you do manage to attract people to a different state, so there's the schemes in Australia that's trying to, that try to attract people to um, states other than the big three, um, those people will still tend to move to the kind of the economic hotspots within that state. So Northern Territory in Australia is quite good. It's an, it's, it kind of goes against the trend. So in Australia, they generally don't retain, retain people. Um, I mean, they really don't uh, but from these schemes. But Northern Territory does, but it retains people in a few small spots that are actually already economically quite vibrant. You know, locals move there and, and, and so do migrants. Mm. Um, so you're absolutely right. You, you can put those sorts of restrictions on. Some countries also run into human rights issues around mm. a restriction on movement. Yes, I think absolutely. they found 
learned generally that they can do it for maybe two or three years mm. on a, uh, you know tied to a particular visa but i think it's very problematic to try and do it beyond that you have to cover off all those things like you know special circumstances what if the employer goes under what if you have a personal grievance against your employer what if your employer mm. wants to transfer you somewhere else um, so you know there's a raft of nitty-gritty detail that yes absolutely you have to work through and i think it can only be temporary the other thing to say about the Scottish visa proposal is that the Scottish government have said that they would, it would include a, what they've described as a less restrictive approach to family migration. And they've said that they will get their expert working group on population to look at what, what the impact of family migration currently is in Scotland. I don't think that report is, has been produced as yet. Somebody on the call may know. Um, but you also then have to think about if you're going to tie people to a particular place, does that mean their spouse, their family, their mm. kids? What about their adult kids who might want to go to university? You know, so how, how wide, if you're going to be more generous on the family side, you also need to think about the restrictions on the family side as well. It would seem to me that too many constraints are frankly inhuman, but um, that's just my own view. Yeah. Okay, um, thank, thanks for that. And, um, sorry, I'll, I'll... sorry um, it's Olivia Pearson, Scottish Government here. It was just to say that the family migration paper will be out um, at some point in the summer. Thanks. Thank you, Olivia. We'll watch out for that. Um, Charlie Rayburn. Yeah, thank you very much, Heather, and uh, good to hear from a country I'm very fond of uh, and uh, hoping it's not too windy today. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of new in this territory, but I'm, I value particularly your presentation because I'm learning a lot as we go. Uh, it does strike me we need to be very clear what we're doing. Uh, that's coming across. And I'm, I was really making a point of my question. For us, I don't think, you know, there's been this, in my view, terrible period of Brexit discussion and non-discussion. Uh, we need, to, I think, to learn from our European neighbours quite a lot. And I'm not convinced we're doing that. And take a small example, Estonia, which is an amazingly small country, yeah. but doing extraordinarily well. So we need to look at how they've been doing this and link it to the IT world and all of that. So just a little bit more, if you could explore it. And, and I'm conscious, you know, we haven't in the report got numbers. And I think you referred to that in a way. Mm. People like me who don't know much about it, we need to be a little, be better informed on numbers. And because it's the scale that people, and I really loved your bit at the end there about, you know, consulting with the local communities, because that's my own view going forward. We have to do it work at a local level. It's mm. about how we live with each other. So uh, just a, a little bit more exploration, particularly of the European experiences, because the, each of them, you know, if you take Sweden and Denmark, they have very different policies. So, uh, you know, just, just some thoughts, perhaps, just quickly. Yeah, and actually, if I can just, just pick up on that briefly, you know, I mentioned about the potential importance of employment. Um, employment is the, the single biggest predictor of successful settlement outcomes. So even, and as I said, you know, people need to make, to make a living. Um, but I, uh, there's also studies from Sweden and Germany that I've cited in the paper that shows that people who have a job offer before they arrive are more likely to remain in the country. So you're saying, what, you know, what can you do to retain? Whether that retains them in rural areas, I don't know, but they are more likely, if we're talking Scotland vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the UK, you're more likely to remain if you had a job offer, offer at the point that you arrived. Um, so uh, and the other thing to say actually about the, you mentioned Estonia, it sparked off a thought, um, which is really about um, permanent. So, so this paper focused on long-term settlement because that seemed to be a particular kind of goal or, asp or aspiration in, in the Scottish work that, that I looked at. Um, but I think that, you know, traditionally immigration was something that you did once in your lifetime. You know, you moved, you stayed there for 30 years, you had children or whatever. But now there's a lot of people and especially highly skilled people, but actually of course, some people who are, who are, who are on low, low wages, who move every few years. They're interested in going and living in a place for a few years. They're not necessarily looking to stay there for the rest of their lives. There's people who live in one country and work in another, and I'm, I'm one of those. And there's people who, you know, when we don't have travel restrictions, spread their time between countries. So I think rather than thinking about settlement, um, a country should think about how can it get 
the most from people who may not be wanting to be based in a country permanently and who might contribute for a shorter period. And um, so I don't think, you know, permanence as the, as the goal or the measure of success might be a mistake. It might be better to think in terms of contribution. So, so that's one thought. And the other thought, just because it isn't in the paper, but it is European evidence, is that, and it goes to that point of what can you do that isn't policy and that the Scottish government could do now. And um, what we do know is that um, uh, it matters. So this is, you know, kind of social science techie stuff, but it matters whether people have bridging or bonding capital. And this goes to the family issue, actually. So, you know, bonding is where you have, you know, a, a close set of people around you, maybe your family, maybe other migrants from the same region or, or whatever. And bridging is, you know, wider networks that help you bridge into the broader community. Um, and what we find is that the migrants that are stronger on the bridging side, and this is mostly European research, um, they have more secure employment, they have higher incomes, they have better language um, skills, and they have higher educational qualifications. The migrants that are stronger on the bonding side, that bonding capitals so are having your family there, it does help you settle, there's no doubt about it, but they tend to be more segregated in terms of the local population. Um, and they also tend to have a wider range of well-being outcomes. So that means that some of them have really high well-being, happiness, subjective well-being, you know, whatever the measure is, but actually some of them have really low well-being. So I think if you're thinking about, so what can you do to, you know, the things I talked about before, what you could do were mostly about how you attract people and you take a more targeted approach and so on. But this is about once people are in the country, what are the things that you can do that are more likely to cement their, 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 them in the country and to, to ensure that they have good community and employment outcomes? Okay, thanks, Heather. Um, one last question from me, uh, because we're just about out of time, and I'm quite surprised it hasn't been raised by someone on the call. Hong Kong, um, which obviously, uh, you know, is something that everyone's looking at quite greedily at the moment in terms of potential uh, immigrants. Um, I'm pretty sure Scotland would be quite pleased to take a, a bunch of people from Hong Kong. Is there anything we could be doing to, to make that happen? Um, so that's a classic example of, of targeting. You know, it's a very classic example. So there's a particular pace there. So, so migrant movements are to do with push factors and pull factors usually, and usually there's both. So um, you, know, you know you've got your push factors there, but being very specific about what, where the opportunities are. And I don't mean in general terms, we need doctors or we need engineers. You know, we have a hospital here who needs five doctors, et cetera, et cetera. There was a local authority in New Zealand, I've cited it in the paper, that, that did a great scheme where they basically got a whole heap of CVs, they got a bunch of firms in, they said, which of these people would you give a job to if, if when you interviewed them, you, you, you know, they measured up to what you need. And actually they ended up, the local authority paid to fly the people in for the interviews. So that was, you know, very, very targeted and specific. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Well, I think that brings us probably to a, a, a nice ending. And Heather, I know this report has drawn interest from all the right places. It's great to see uh, someone from the Scottish Government on the call and such a wide range of sectors and backgrounds get engaged. We'll be hearing more about this in due course. It's something Reform Scotland is, is keen to carry on with. So thank you for giving us your time at such a late hour. It must be after 11 now in it's Wellington. after 11, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd be off, I'd be off to bed. It's my peaceful time when the children are asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we'd like to thank again the Scottish Policy Foundation for their support in Absolutely. producing the research and, and holding today's event. I'll just say our next event is next Thursday uh, and it should be a good day. Our Commission on School Reform is launching its Education Manifesto for Holyrood 2021 and typical to form it will pose some Pretty hard questions to our politicians, as well as offering some radical but well-researched solutions, shall we say. So it's, it's one I urge you not to miss. Uh, I think the invites have already gone out, but if not, you can get in touch with us and we'll make sure you are invited. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Heather. Thanks for your questions. And thank your you. And all the best to everyone. Bye-bye. Yep.